praise the Lamb of God. Amen. Please be seated. We'd like for all of the Riverbend kids to come to the front, ages 4 to 11. And uh, maybe we need to stop and have a few minutes prayer for them back there tonight. Brother Larry and Sister Ashley are uh, leading Riverbend kids. So, all right, y'all ready to go back? Come on, give me a high five when you come by me, Carson. Can you do that? All right, some of them won't do it. They don't like me. All right, but you show them how, show them how it's done. We, there we go. Go on back. Head on back. Head on back. You go ahead, Carson. Show them how it's done. Come on. That's what I'm talking about, Ninja. Now, I know Brindley, she ain't going to do it. She ain't going to do it. He ain't either. There we go. There we go. There's Bo. Oh, he ain't doing it either. He'll come around. He'll come. There's, look at here. Look at here. I wish uh, I wish all the, I wish I had a picture of Finley giving the offering because I'd stick it I'd stick it up on that screen every time. She's grinning from ear to ear the whole way down there with her handful of money ready to give in the offering. The rest of us are coming up here like something's pulling us, you know, like, ah. And boy, she's running up there, got all them pennies in her hand. Boy, she dumped them in there, Brother Billy, and she grinned about that big. Amen. All the students can go back. River Bend Ignited can go back ages um, 12 to 18. And uh, and the rest of you get to stay out here. Boy, I'm all ready. Brother Jerry? You got your hand out? Did you get a hand out? Okay. If I start having trouble with my voice, I want you to come up here and take over for me. Yes, sir. All right. Hey, Amen. My voice, for some reason, is a little cattywampus tonight. And uh, so, boy, I'm going to try to do something to cover a whole chapter in about, well, I ain't going to say how long. You might get scared. But, uh, Man, I read this yesterday, and I studied, and I read it, and I studied, and uh, I carry all my stuff in a backpack, okay? Businesses ain't too comfortable when a big old sucker like me comes walking in with a backpack. Everybody's starting getting their eyes peeled like, "Uh uh-oh, well, we got some kind of crazy guy coming in here, but uh, I sat there yesterday, I said it. I got to go back to Barnes and Noble. I almost want to run the aisles. I ain't been there in a year. And uh, I got to go. And then here comes Sister Meredith and Sister Casey bothering me while I was there. And then I went over to McAllister's. Anybody ever go to McAllister's? Boy, I got some good tea at that place, man. (laughs) Anyway, I think I stayed too long, Sister Maria, because they all started coming by my table looking at me all cockeyed and stuff. So... I didn't mean to stay very long, but it ended up being like, I think like an hour and a half or something like that. And uh, so anyway, because I was in the Word, Jeremiah 32, and uh, I'm excited about this. Jeremiah, on the surface, really doesn't have anything to hang success on. If you study the whole book of Jeremiah, it does not look like... He did any good for anybody. Everybody he preached to didn't like him. They, one time they told him, they said, we want you to go pray and seek the Lord. And whatever the Lord tells you to tell us to do, we're going to do it. And he went and sought the Lord and he came back and told them, don't go to Egypt. And they said, we don't like what you said. You're going to jail and we're going to Egypt. So they weren't listening to to anything that he said. And uh, so it looks like a failure. Now, y'all going to be with me now? Everybody got their paper? Everybody got their paper? We're going to try to do the scriptures just a little bit maybe. But uh, we we got to get Sister Heidi well. And we got to, uh, Sister Amanda's going to help me. If it don't go good, it's my fault. 
or I did something wrong if it don't go good. Amen. All right, Jeremiah was all time. Let me, let me say this real quickly. Everybody with me now? We kind of been milling around a little bit and talking and wanted to be like the kids and stuff. But uh, how many of you know that we don't like being told you're wrong? Stop. Quit. Jeremiah was doing that all the time. The people of Israel were all jacked up and messed up. And, and he was and he, he kind of told the Lord in the beginning, they ain't going to pay me any attention. You know, and the Lord said, you don't worry about their faces. Jeremiah chapter 1, you, you might ought to go read it. Because that's when he tells Jeremiah, he said, listen boy, before you was in your mama, I knew you. He said, while you was in your mama, I sanctified you. I've anointed you and I've made you a prophet to the nations. Stop doubting yourself. If you don't hear nothing that I say the rest of the night, let that be from the Lord for you. Stop doubting that God can do with you what you think he's going to do with you. Stop doubting. Stop doubting. Now, I should have done this earlier because it ain't going to work. But I'm so excited. So, so, so excited. Brother Huntley, I heard Brother Huntley preach. If you never heard Brother Wayne Huntley, look him up on YouTube. He's dynamite. But I heard Brother Huntley preach a couple of years ago at General Conference uh, when he said we got to stop measuring the health of our congregation by how many booties is in the seats and start measuring it by how many hands is in the harvest. Uh-huh. I'm so excited to tell you that at my last count, we either have going or about to start seven different home Bible studies with seven different teachers. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, isn't that exciting? Man, I'm telling you what, ladies and gentlemen, that is hands in the harvest. We're not looking to have a house full of people just sit here and do nothing. But when we have 7 or 17 or 77 that are going out and working throughout the week and witnessing to somebody and bringing them in, Brother Terrence, we're going to see revival like we've been hoping to see. Amen? Oh, y'all ought to be more happy about that. Come on now. we excited about what God's doing. So Jeremiah's prophesying. Jeremiah's prophesying of a coming judgment upon the people of Jerusalem. And his prophecy is, he said, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city, that's Jerusalem, into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he'll take it. I'm going to let Babylon whoop you. I'm going to let Babylon take you. And I want you to follow me best you can tonight. Because if you don't have your Bible, it's going to be tough. But you got your hand out. He told the king, whose name was Zedekiah, he said to and when the Babylon comes and takes over this city, you're not going to escape. But a matter of fact, you're going to be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. He even, I think he even says something to the effect, you're going to be standing eye to eye with him face to face. You're not going to escape. He said, you'll fight against the Chaldeans, but you will not prosper. You're going to fight against that enemy, but you're not going to win. So... It appears that every time Jeremiah talks to the king, he's got the same prophecy. Judgment's coming, judgment's coming. The king got tired of hearing it and he got tired of Jeremiah telling everybody. So man, I hope I can hang on for just a minute. My goodness, I got to quit saying that, but still yet. I... In order to shut the man of God up, they did as they did at other times. They locked Jeremiah up in jail to stop him from preaching this word from God. Now, verse number six. Are you ready? You ready to go? I hope you got your seatbelts on. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse number six. Where is Jeremiah? In prison, locked up so that they can do. Why did they lock him up? Shut him up. Very good. Y'all with me? Better be careful what might happen tonight because y'all with me. In verse number 6, And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me saying. What's that tell us? They might shut him down, but they can't stop the voice of the Lord from coming in. 
I want you to hear me right now. I don't care where you are, what you're doing. I've got testimonies in my back pocket of the Lord ministering to people on a bar stool. I've got witnesses in my back pocket of the Lord witnessing to people in honky tonks and beer joints and in the back seat of a car they ain't got no business being in. I want to let you know something right now. One of the most powerful times the Lord will speak to you is when you're in the middle of messing up. And if I can do anything tonight is to call this congregation to shake yourself and open up your ears and say, I want to hear what the Lord is saying. Sister Maria, what kind of a God is it that will reach down into prison and speak to somebody? And the devil and man and nothing can stop him. Look at here. It is proven once again that the limitations placed upon us by man cannot shut down the voice of God. I don't care what's happening in your life. I don't care how broke you are. I don't care how much is coming against you. I don't care how depressed you are, how oppressed you are. Whatever's got you locked up, the voice of the Lord can still speak to you. Well, let's just go a little further. And the limitations of man, I read this this week and I loved it, can't hinder the work of God. They threw, anybody ever read Acts chapter number five? That's, I know some of you, that's where Ananias is so fire to get all jacked up lying to the Lord. Somebody said, ooh. But here's what happened. Peter and John after the lame man gets healed in Acts chapter number 3, they start seeing revival and miracles and an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And the religious people, the religious people decide they don't like it. So they threw them in jail. Ain't it crazy? There's always somebody trying to shut truth down. huh? But guess what? It ain't never worked. It ain't never worked. And it ain't going to work right now. There's some people in this house uh, that the devil thinks he's got you beat, uh, but the voice of the Lord is about to speak into your prison and you're going to rise up and you're going to become what God wants you to be right out of the gutter. I feel this in my heart so strongly that this I am to minister till the Lord stops me. I am to minister faith and I'm to minister hope. Faith and hope. Because if you can believe, all things are possible. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in prison. It was Peter and John in the book of Acts that they got thrown into jail because the Lord performed miracles. And an angel came and none of the jailers even knew it. Brother Billy opened the door and guess what the angel said? He said, y'all come out of jail. You ready? Go right back to where you was preaching when they arrested you. The next morning they came to check on their prisoners and they weren't there. And everybody said, oh goodness, what happened to the prisoners? And the next thing you know, they hear something going on down at the temple and said, them same old boys we locked up, they're out of jail and they're preaching in the temple. They begin to handle them a little bit differently then. And then the Holy Ghost can't be stopped by man's limitations. The Apostle Paul on numerous occasions. If you ever get the opportunity to read some of Fox's Book of Martyrs and other documented uh, writings, find out. Brother Billy, they had to change out Paul's guards on a like a two-hour shift or a three-hour shift. Because Brother Jerry, if they left them there longer than that, he'd have them converted. Do you think about that just for a minute? Paul is the one behind the bars. And the jailers are standing out there guarding him. And if they left him there long enough, he would have them converted. Do you understand? There's nothing that can stop the power of the Holy Ghost if a vessel will just let him begin to flow through him. Your circumstances are not bigger than the mission of God. And your circumstances aren't bigger than your purpose. God's going to keep working. God's going to keep moving. Now, here we go. Brother Terrence, I can't preach and even preach good without meddling with us a little bit. He didn't say, Sister Maria, he doesn't say that you're going to always be able to do it the, always, the way you've always done it. But he did say, they're not going to stop you. Huh? Come on now. It might hinder us from doing it the way we've always done it. 
But man's limitations cannot stop the work of God. Isaiah 43 and 13 says, Yea, before the day was, before there ever was a day, I am He. I was the one that was there before the sun came up the first time. He said, and there's nobody that can deliver you out of my hand. There's no, when I got my hand on you, nobody can pow, overpower me. He said, I will work. I will work. And who shall let it? Now, word let means reverse, undo, hinder, or stop me. Who is going to stop? The Lord is asking a rhetorical question. Because the answer is, if you're in the hand of God and you're under the hand of God, there is not a force known to man that can stop you. Brother Cody, if we ever start believing this stuff, we ever start believing this stuff, here's, one, here's a picture I see. I'm just going to pull somebody, Brother Ira. Brother Ira calls me at 5.30 on Wednesday and says, ain't going to be able to be at church tonight, Pastor. That's what he calls me, Pastor. I like it too. Said, I ain't going to be able to be at church tonight. I run into somebody down in m and They ask me what we believe. I'm going to teach them a Bible study. Can't be at church. I'm going to teach a Bible study. And let me tell you something. I see it, Sister Maria. It's going to happen. About 8.05. The door's going to open in the back, and here's going to come Brother Ira and his buddy. He's going to say, got to stop things just for a minute because I taught him the Word of God. He wants to be baptized in Jesus' name. That's the vision that I see happening in this place all the time. I see it happening. I'm going to work, and who's going to stop me? Keeping that in mind, while in prison... While in prison, because of preaching truth regarding the coming judgment, the defeat of Jerusalem, the imprisonment of the king, and the captivity of the people, while being punished for doing the right thing, Jeremiah gets a word from God. And he says in verse number 7, Behold... Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, so Hanamiel is Jeremiah's cousin, shall come unto thee in prison. The Lord saying, Terrence, the Lord is telling him, your cousin Hanamiel is going to come to you in prison, and he's going to tell you that there's a piece of property that it's your right to buy it. Okay, that's going to happen. What in the world does he need buying property in prison? Huh? While you're in prison, your cousin is going to come and let you know you're next in line to purchase a field in Anathoth, which is a whole other message I could preach because it's a city of refuge. Anathoth is. So guess what happens in verse, the Lord says in verse number seven, your cousin's going to come and tell you he's got a piece of property you're supposed to buy. Brother Jerry, he's in prison. And the word of the Lord came to him. So guess what happened in verse number eight? Anybody got a guess what happened? Cousin came to prison. So Hannah Mill, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, By my field, I pray thee, that is his Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin, whole nother tribe, whole nother city, whole nother area. Jeremiah's locked up in Jerusalem. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then... I knew it was the word of the Lord. The Lord said, your cousin's going to come, got a piece of property for you. Next thing he knows, here comes cousin, got a piece of property for me. Yes, sir. At that time, that property was being inhabited by a Babylonian army. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the truth. Judgment's coming. What's Jeremiah been prophesying? Why is he in jail? He told them, you messed up, judgment's coming. Babylon's going to destroy you. The king is going to be taken prisoner. And the city's coming down. And you're in prison. Now, now y'all ready for this? But I want you to buy a piece of property. And I want you to invest in the future of a defeated land. Are you with me? I told you this place is going to be destroyed. I told you Babylon is coming and they're going to win. You're not going to be able to defeat them. So Babylon is going to conquer this land. So I want you to pay somebody money for a piece of property. Is there ain't nobody but me that that sounds kind of goofy to? All right. Like, okay, what in the world is going on here? So verse number nine. Now I want you to notice this. I don't have time to explain all of the nuances and the details, but basically in nine through 12, he gets it appraised. He gets the abstract and the deed and the title and everything. He, man, he didn't just buy it. He didn't just say, okay, here's your money, fine, whatever. But he did it the right way. He did it completely. He did it legally. He did it ethically, according to the law of the land, according to uh, uh, the procedures of the Jews. He paid him the money. He got witnesses. He sealed the part that's supposed to be sealed. He left open the part that was supposed to be left open. He operated out of prison 100% ethically, legally, and morally. Hear me right now. Man. I know that I'm not very clear right now, but this is all fixing to tie together. But I want you to know something. He did this knowing that judgment was coming. Wholeheartedly. He didn't just buy it. He didn't just say, all right, buddy, here you go. It ain't going to be worth nothing in a few days anyway. He didn't allow his circumstances nor the pending judgment to sway him from operating, are you ready? In excellence. He is making, satisfying the requirements of a government that he has done prophesied is about to be overthrown. Somebody needs to hear the word of the Lord right now. Hear the word of the Lord. When we are doing God's business, we cannot but do it with excellence no matter our circumstances. I'm going to say that one more time. When we're doing God's business, you see, Brother Billy, there wasn't nothing about this that made sense except one thing. What was it? God said it. I don't want to tie it together right now, but I'm going to anyway. There's a reason why the Lord, the Bible says he chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He's got to be God in every circumstance. This makes no sense. But Jeremiah didn't allow the fact that he knew what was going to happen to knock him off his game. He didn't do things halfway. He didn't do things half-heartedly. He didn't do things weakly. He didn't do things begrudgingly. He did it wholeheartedly. Dotted every I, dotted every T. When we're working for the Lord, we got to do it excellent. Oh, I'm going to go here. I don't really know if I'm supposed to. That's why... When we clean the church, we clean it to the best of our ability. Ah, come on now. 
That's why when we go do anything for the Lord, it needs to be done with excellence. Do you understand what I mean by excellence? The exact way it's supposed to be done. He's doing it in the valley, Brother Jerry, like he would on the mountain. Oh, don't say that word just yet. Then verse 13 and 14, he got a guy named Baruch, and he, that was one of the witnesses. He said, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences. This evidence of the purchase, the deed, the abstract, the title, all of the papers. And put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. Which means put it somewhere safe. Now I want you to know something. Jeremiah don't have a clue in the world why he's doing this. I'm going to prove that to you in just a minute. Brother Terrence, what I'm about to teach us. If, if, I'm not, if I'm not chasing rabbits too much, what I'm about to teach us is a principle that will keep you, that if we can get it embedded in who we are, will keep us. He said, take all these papers. Take all these papers and put them in an earthen jar and put a lid on it somewhere safe. Marcus, the city's falling. The country's falling. The king is falling. And Babylon's going to be ruling. But the Lord said, buy you a piece of property. And Jeremiah did it to the fullest of his ability. Where it can be kept safe for many days. In verse 15. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. What does that tell him? Judgment is not for forever. Somebody hear me. It came out of our, of our, of our book uh, on being a servant of God. I never realized it before. It was so simple. But the discipline of God has a purpose. And the purpose is always the same for everybody. It's restoration. This judgment that the Lord's bringing on the people of Israel does not negate the promise of, nor the uh, uh, mission of who they are. They just got to get back on track. And when they get back on track, they better be ready. You understand that the Lord is preparing Jeremiah already for victory. He's preparing him for revival. He's preparing him for when it all comes back together. Now this is, this is, this is really foolish. This really doesn't have any reason. I'm getting you prepared, foolish as it may seem. When restoration comes, you'll be ready. Now I want you to notice what happens here. Then, what does your handout say in the next thing? Anybody following along with me? Sealed it all up. Jeremiah is what? All right, foolish preparation. That's what we just talked about. Then Jeremiah prayed. Does anybody see what, what the formula is for success? Mm -mm. He heard from the Lord. Then what? Obeyed it. He did it. Not even fully understanding. He got a judgment from God, a word of prophecy, and now he has a word of hope. Don't make no sense. So what are you going to do? You're going to destroy him or are you going to save him? What's happening here? But he obeyed God without understanding completely. Then he went to make sure he got on the same page with God. He got a word from the Lord. Then he went to prayer. To get things worked out with the Lord. Now his prayer is verses 16 to 25. And I'm going to summarize it here for you. I do too. Hold on to that thought. Hold on to that thought. Because that comes back and bites him in a minute. He does pray it. He does pray it. And I like it too. But hold on to that. Because that's going to come back and haunt him in just a minute. 
He starts out praying and he says, you created the world and all that's in it and there's nothing too hard for you. You're a good and gentle God. Your eyes are open and you see your people. You brought your people out of Egyptian bondage and servitude and you did it with great signs and wonders and by virtue of your miraculous hand, the world was introduced to you and your reputation grew. You remember Rahab said, we've been hearing about the Red Sea and all of that stuff. The Lord's reputation began to grow as he brought his people out of Egyptian bondage. He said, you kept your promise and you brought your people to this land and you allowed them to possess it. So he spends a little time praying about how great the Lord is and in the next few verses he says but these sorry people won't listen to nothing you say they won't live according to your law they haven't done anything you commanded them to do the judgment that's coming is their fault look at the size and the influence of the enemy that's come against them look at the peril of sword famine and pestilence that's wreaking havoc upon them everywhere we turn everywhere we look there's judgment and these sorry people have earned it you're a great God and you've got a stupid group of people to work with anybody reading along with me that's what it says he talks about how great the Lord is and about how terrible everybody out here is and then he says, and you told me to buy a piece of property? You told me to make an investment into the land of a defeated people. So why exactly did you tell me, a prisoner, to buy a piece of property in this wretched land, doomed, defeated, oppressed land that is characterized by such a pitiful people. He's really saying, anybody know what he's really saying? There ain't but one fella around here that's any good and it's the one talking to you and you've got me here in prison This prayer ought to encourage us. When all hell breaks loose in your life, you go pray this prayer. Like, Lord, I've been trying to do everything I'm supposed to do. All these other people ain't. It. Now, if you ever prayed more than like a month, you found yourself praying that prayer. Now, Lord, there's something wrong with this picture. I go to church all the time, give an offering, pay my tithes. I've been wanting a new boat for 37 years. And this lunkhead over here don't come to church half the time. I know he ain't paying tithes. I don't never see him go up and put nothing in the offering. And that sucker done had three boats. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We've prayed that way. Ain't fair, Lord. kind of what Jeremiah was doing. I did what you told me to do. Ronnie, this ain't much different than when the Lord, we talked about this the other day, when the Lord came to the disciples and said, y'all had any luck? No, ain't caught nothing. Been fishing all night and ain't caught nothing. He said, well, go down and let your net on the other side of the boat. And the Lord, and Peter said, listen, we've been doing this already all night long and ain't caught nothing. But nevertheless, I mean, that's what he was saying. Well, because you said so, we'll do it. They go out and they drop the net over the boat. And the next thing you know, the boat's like tipped up on its side. The fish is flopping all out of it. And they're standing up waving at all their buddies and saying, y'all come get some. Y'all come get some. And as soon as Peter ran up to the Lord, he fell down on his face before him and said, oh, God, you better get away from me because I'm stupid. That's what he said. I'm a sinful man. You better get away from me. I doubted you. I thought I knew more than you. I thought I was the fisherman. That's exactly what's happening here. Jeremiah is saying, I obeyed you, but I don't really know what you're doing. And what's the deal with this property? Because in his mind, Brother Jerry, you know what that property's worth? He ain't even going to be there to enjoy it. 
Foolish. Boy, I'm excited. I got to get done here. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, verse number 26. Here we go, Brother Billy. Saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. And then he says, What's the punctuation at the end of that? So you know what? Man, think about this. I didn't see it till I got to studying. You know what the Lord is saying to Jeremiah? Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah started off his prayer and said, Oh, there's nothing too hard for you. Now the Lord is saying, You know what that tells us? The Lord is reading your mail when you nail down to him. So let's just cut through all the junk and be real. What Jeremiah, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. What Jeremiah should have said, Lord, I don't have a clue in the world what you're doing. I don't know if we're going or if we're coming. I don't know what's happening. Instead, he tries to give all of this fluff to the Lord. And the first thing the Lord says, I am the Lord God. I know who I am. But is there anything too hard for me? Is there really? Boy, I could preach right now. Is there anything too hard for me? Do you really believe that? I know you pray it. I know you pray, God, you can do anything, but do you really believe it? Do you believe that I, you're in prison and I told you, I told you to go buy a piece of property from a doomed and defeated land? I told you to make an investment. I told you to make an investment where it don't make no sense. He said, you're right. I'm going to allow the enemy to do what I said I would. He said, you read it in there. But he said, it's going to be worse than what you imagined. They're going to burn it down. They're going to tear it down. He said, these people have disobeyed me ever since this city's been built. For virtue of their entire existence, they've disobeyed me. Somebody needs to hear the word of the Lord right now. The Lord is ministering. I come to minister hope. Look at here. He said, they've desecrated my teaching and they've desecrated my house. They've built altars to Baal and they've made their children walk through the fires of Molech. Now you study that out for yourself. But basically, they built the fire of coals and burning fire and stuff and they made their kids walk across it as some kind of stupid worship to an idolatrous God who wasn't even real. But the Lord is aware. Understand, the Lord is aware of everything everybody does. He's aware. Now, you got to hang with me right now. They've done many, many horrible things in the name of worship that I didn't command them. Now, everybody say now. Now, now I'm going to give this city to Babylon. Verse 37. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whether I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath, and I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. Look at here. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. We're talking about the same people. We're talking about the people that went all crazy. And the Lord said, I saw it. But I'm going to bring judgment for a little while. But there's coming a day that I'm going to bring them back because it's my people and it's my land and it's my purpose. And the devil is not going to glory in my people family. I'm going to bring them back to where they belong. Somebody ought to get excited in the Holy Ghost because you know we are witnesses that he still does it. We're witnesses that this wasn't just for Jeremiah's day, but it's for our day. For thus saith the Lord, 42, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, 
so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. Brother Jerry, aren't we glad that he don't just see me stupid. He sees me delivered. He sees me restored. I know, God, I know the thoughts I think about you. And I know the plans that I think about you. And a little bit of stupid is not going to destroy a whole lot of miracles. Lord have mercy. I don't know what to do. One of them says 72, one of them says 67. One of them is lying. I need to pray some Jeremiah prayers on them thermostats. Verse 43. And fields shall be bought in this land. Look here. He said, I hear what you're saying about this land. You say it's desolate. You say it's without man or beast. Here you go, Brother Billy. You say it's given into the hand of the Chaldeans. That's what you say. But Jeremiah sees things through his carnal reality. But God is declaring to him, my plan hasn't changed. In spite of its shortcomings, God still sees the land of promise. Jeremiah's in prison and gets a word from the Lord. And he buys property and subscribes the evidence before witnesses. And he says, just as sure as my word reached you in prison, it'll reach all of my people. And as sure as my word came to pass for you, you bought land before witnesses and it was your right. I hope you can see this as I bring it all together right now. Jeremiah was locked up. The people of Israel are about to be locked up. Jeremiah took possession of something that was his while he was in prison. Jeremiah is going to Babylon with the, the people of Israel. Do you know what's happening right here? Can anybody see what's happening? I'm trying to stay up here so I can stay on TV. Does anybody see what the Lord is doing in the life of Jeremiah? What's that? He's making sure he's taking, oh, you're right. He's using Jeremiah as an example of what he's fixing to do for all the people. Jeremiah is a, a living witness. He obeyed, but he didn't understand. He wasn't in failure, but he was reaping the results of it. It's not much different than the Joshua and Caleb wandering in the wilderness with all the other ones that didn't believe. Do you understand? Stop trying to climb out of your mess and start asking God, what are you trying to do in my life that is a picture of what you want to do for the people? Are we making sense right now? What you, The first thing, when opposition comes against us, and I'm coming to a close, I'm setting a world record tonight. The opposition that's in your life ain't there because you're bad. It's there because you have a purpose for God. God has a plan in your life. Your failure that you bowed down to, that you gave into, them moments when we all go completely bonkers, the Lord is going to take that and he's going to use it to bring you back to where he wants to be. And you are going to be an example to the people of what God can do. Sister Maria, Jeremiah was one of the good guys. But what does his prayer tell us? 
Huh? What's his prayer telling us? I really don't know. I really don't know more than nobody. I'm in just as bad a shape as everybody else. Except for one thing. He already owns some land. He had already put an investment into what looked like it was defeated. And he said, go put it in an earthen vessel. And the book says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of God and not of us. What's the devil going to do when you stop viewing your problems as problems? Come here, boy. What, what's the devil going to do when you stop viewing your problems as problems and start viewing them as part of the process? And start viewing them? You, let me tell you what you'll do. Let me tell you what you'll do. You'll never look at your failure the same way. But more than that, you will never look at failure in somebody else the same way. Because you've got a bigger picture. You know that what God has already done in you, he did that so, so that everybody that comes in here, no matter what kind of mess they're in, what kind of baggage they're bringing, how wounded or how messed up they are, that you can sit down next to them and say, let me tell you what, it don't make much sense right now. And I don't even understand everything he does. But I can tell you that I was on my way out. I was locked up. I was tied up. I was oppressed. And I was wore down. But the Lord gave me a word in the middle of my mess. And you know what? He kept his promise. And here I am. Here I am. Here I am. I'm not defeated. I may not be already there yet, but I ain't where I was. Stand with me. Is there anybody got anything they'd like to say about this lesson tonight? Go right ahead, sister friend. Do what now? I'm done. Oh, okay. Well, is it about the lesson? Oh, then wait just a minute then. Okay. Did everybody get where we're going tonight? How many of us have lived our life, walk out of a fiery service of the Holy Ghost, and all you think about is your failures? But when the devil starts lobbing it up there and piling it on you, all we got to say is, I really don't know what the Lord's doing, but I trust him. Because if nothing else, I can go to the book. And he did it in Jeremiah's life. And he's done it in our lives. And he's going to do it in yours. And we know that all things work together for good to them that woo, love the Lord who are the called according to his purpose. He gave his life for us. He told Jeremiah, he said, they ain't done nothing right since they started. But I got faith they're going to. I got faith they're going to make it. I got faith they're going to come out. And they're going to come back to this land. And I'm going to bring them from every place I sent them to. And they're going to buy land. Jeremiah was just a type a small example of the plan of God coming to pass in everybody's life. Lord, we thank you tonight. Thank you for this service, for your word, for truth, the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord, that my failures don't define me. I'm thankful they don't define me with you either. God, but you've got plans, you've got dreams, you've got thoughts of me. I want to align myself with them and trust you, obey you. I may come into prayer and say, Lord, would you please let me know what you're doing? But at the end of the day, I'm going to trust you and lean not into my own understanding. In all my ways, acknowledge you and you'll direct my path. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. You ready to go back to your mama? You don't want to go back to your mama? Okay. I don't blame you. Yes, ma'am, Sister Fran. Oh, okay. That's what I'm talking about.
Do what now? So the man has everything, but it's perfect. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Can I open it now or will I be embarrassed? Oh, it's my favorite color. I already like it. What's this for? For you. <laughs> oh, pastor, because hardcore devil stomping ninja isn't an official job title. That's what I'm talking about. I'm going to hang that up on my wall because that's what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> Sunday morning, we're back to regular schedule. Let a 10 o'clock elements class, 11 o'clock worship service. Sunday night, everybody say Sunday night. Sunday night. At 5 o'clock, service starts at 5 o'clock at Kennett. If you need the Holy Ghost, go. If you got somebody you know that needs the Holy Ghost, take them over there. Brother Jesse Cornejo is a young evangelist, mightily used of God in seeing people filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I hope we can take a whole crowd with us to Kennett. We don't do much on Sunday nights right now, but we can go over there. Service starts at 5. We'll be done by like 9. After we've had 25, get the Holy Ghost. Amen. Why not? Pray about it a little bit before we go Sunday. Is there any more announcements? Love y'all. You're dismissed. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight. Make sure you speak to our guest. All right, buddy.